Well, we are in the final week of a sermon series that I've been preaching. And uh, if you don't know, I preached at Glen this morning for Pastor Randy, so I'm extra sweaty this morning. So if you hug me, I warn you, uh, I'm pre-soaked, okay? Uh, Hug me at your own risk. But uh, if you're just joining us today, we've, we've been in this, we've had three previous weeks, this is the fourth week, and what I'm talking about, kind of that really big issue is that, that there are people who, who have reasons, they say, that they don't believe in God, but oftentimes those are reasons and rejections of a God that doesn't truly exist. Uh, they, they have obstacles, they have barriers, they have hurdles, they have uh, false ideas that, uh, of who God is, and, and, and they go... Yeah, I can't believe in that God. But as Christians, we need to be clear, we don't believe in that God either. That's not who God truly is. And so we want to be able to be equipped, and and maybe if you're that person today, maybe I will help you take down some of those barriers. And what I want to talk today about is one of the most, probably the most common embraced, distorted view of who God is. And that's what I would call the heartless God. Um... 1 Peter 1, through, 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 will be our key verses, and you'll see this in a little bit. Uh, there are few uh, Bibles or in the seats in front of you, iPhones, whatever you got. If you want to look it up, it'll be there. We'll get there in a minute. But this heartless God, this idea of, I want to believe, but it kind of seems like sometimes God doesn't really care, right? For example, uh, I, I've got a buddy. Um, friend of mine, who in his, in his mid to late 20s came down with cancer, and it was a pretty severe cancer. And prior to this point, I, I would say that he was probably a, a nominal believer. I think he would probably have admitted at that time in his life that he thought there was a God, but he would also have probably admitted he wasn't following that God in any particular way very closely. But when this cancer came, you see, it, it, was, it was really rough on him. And It nearly took his life a a couple of different times. And he endured, but on the back side of that experience, he he really kind of felt like God wasn't there for him throughout that experience. And and then why did why did he have to get cancer, right? Why did he have to have that? And 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 is this God's way of punishing me by giving me cancer? You see, he, he prayed for it to be taken away, right? He did pray. He prayed for healing. And, and, and eventually, those prayers for healings turned to prayer for, for quick healing from the ramifications of the surgeries and the chemicals and the drugs and the radiation and all the things that he went through. And yet, as he prayed for all of this to be healed and to be taken away and, and whatnot, at the end of the story, as he survived, none of the things that he prayed for had happened. How can you believe in, in a God that doesn't, doesn't answer prayer? Right? And chances are pretty good that many, if not most, if not all of us, have probably had moments kind of like that. Maybe, maybe you're struggling with something right now, even. You're, 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 just, you're, you're praying, you're saying, God, I, I'm trying to believe here, but there's all these things happening, right? How, how, how can I believe in a God that, that doesn't seem to care about me? I mean, it it can be as simple, it doesn't even have to be cancer. You can just turn the news on anymore, right? And see things happening all over the world. Terrorist attacks, innocent people killed, senseless shootings, just random, horrible things happening. How could somebody do that to another being, human being? And and how how could God allow those things to happen? That, that, That doesn't seem fair. It could be a natural disaster, tornadoes, hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons, forest fires, right? We're all breathing in smoke at the moment. People losing lives and property. And you're like, how did this happen? Why? Why did this happen? It doesn't seem to be fair. It can be simple things. You can be... Praying, praying to God that He would do something. You know He can do it. Yet, He doesn't do it. He doesn't take your headaches away. He doesn't answer that prayer that you've been praying for your child. You, you, you're trying to do your best, right? 
You're doing good. You're, you're trying to help other people. And you're, you're working hard. Everybody else seems to be getting ahead. Everybody else but you. And no matter how hard it is that you try, you don't seem to be getting any of the breaks. And whatever it is, maybe in that moment you start to start to ask yourself, God, God, are you even there? And if you are, are you good? I, I want to believe in you, but it kind of seems like you don't care about me. I want to believe in you, God, but man, you seem kind of heartless. Well, if you've ever felt that way, let me just tell you right now, you're not alone. You're not the only one who's ever felt that way. In fact, David in the Old Testament, right? David, the Bible tells us, was a man after God's own heart. But yet David cries out again and again, Where are you, God? Why don't you hear my prayers? Why don't you do something about this? My enemies are after me. God, are you even listening? Wednesday afternoons, uh, I lead a Bible study here at church. We're working our way through the book of Job currently. If you've never read the book of Job, Job can mess with your mind. Right? Job, if you don't know the story of Job, Job is this super righteous guy. He is one of the best guys in the entirety of the Bible. Job is a good man. There's not too many people the Bible says that about. But Job was a righteous and upright man. And Satan comes into the story and wants to attack him and gets actually permission from God and, and through weather events kills all of this man's children and, and through enemies it slaughters all of, his, all of his servants save for three of them who come to tell him bad news and take all of his thousands and thousands and thousands of animals all of the wealth he owned his family destroyed. He gets boils, illness, disease. Whether it was leprosy or elephantitis, we don't know. But he, he goes from living in the penthouse to the poorhouse. He was probably the richest man into the world. And he goes to literally living at the town dump where they burned the dung and garbage. That's the story of Job. And he finds himself one day sitting there with a shard of pottery scraping, oozing pus off of his skin. That's how low he has gone. His friends show up. They turn out to be jerks. His wife comes along and says, Hey, Job, why don't you just curse God and then die? Talk about a need for marriage therapy. <laughs> right? Why don't you die, Job? You'll be so much better off. Where are you, God? This doesn't seem fair. The one, though, that for whatever reason really hits home with me anyhow in the, the Bible is in the New Testament. A guy by the name of John. Not the guy who wrote the book of John, but John the Baptizer or John the Baptist, right? If you're not a, if you're, if you're not a church person, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. Right? And uh, so Jesus knew him. They, they probably grew up as kids. They were just a, a number of months apart, relatively the same age. And this guy's a cousin of Jesus, and he recognizes that he has a very important purpose in life. It was told to his mother, and he has this special job that has been given to him by God. And his job, his very purpose for existence, the reason for his being, is he is to come and, and, and proclaim and to tell people that... Jesus is coming. You better get ready, right? He devotes his entire life to saying, Jesus is coming. Get ready. Repent of your sins. Be baptized. Jesus is coming. And you see, the Jews had been looking for the Messiah. They had been waiting for Jesus to come for thousands of years. And so he comes as a herald saying, It's here, folks. He's here. Get ready. And that's his job. And if you don't know about John, John's kind of like this Kind of crazy, wild guy, right? He wears basically a burlap bag and he eats locusts like grasshoppers and honey. That's his entire diet. I don't know if there's any TV commercials advocating for that diet, but it might work. Anybody tried the locusts and honey diet? Nah, me neither. 
But John starts preaching that Jesus is coming. And people start to listen, and they start to follow John, right? So John says, guys, don't follow me. Uh-uh. Don't follow me. Follow Jesus. See, John is humble. John says, I'm not even worthy to tie this dude's shoes. He, he says, I, I, I'm not even worthy to carry this man's sandals. He's the one, not me. But then you know what happens to John? John gets arrested for all of this. See, John's put into prison. And you have to imagine, you know, you know what, what's John thinking while he's sitting there in jail? I mean, he's like, Jesus is my cousin, right? I've seen his power. He's healed the sick. He's raised the dead. He, I, I've seen him, you know, blind could see. He's turned water into wine. I've been faithful. We're cousins. We're tight, right? I baptized that dude. So, he's going to come. I've done my job, right? Jesus is going to show up. So John sits there in jail. And he waits. And he waits some more. And he's still in jail. Finally, he's like, he goes to one of the other guys, who's kind of one of his associates. He goes, hey buddy, uh, could you go find Jesus? I'm kind of in jail at the moment. Don't have a lot of freedom. Could you go find Jesus and just, could you ask him, are you really the one that we were expecting or, or should we look for somebody else? Because I'm sitting in jail, hello. What happened? Jesus, you could spring me and you haven't done anything about it. Do you even care? I thought we were tight. If you've ever been at that place where you you wanted to believe, but it seemed like God didn't care. You're not the only one. And in the next two minutes, I'll make you two promises. The first one is simply this. I can't answer every question you might have about this subject in a simple sermon. If you're struggling with something, talk with me, talk with one of the people in the church, talk with the deacons, we're here for you. But today won't allow me to answer all the questions you might possibly have. But what today will allow me to do is point you to the one who does have all the answers and someday he will answer for you. What I want to do today is to show you two big thoughts, two, two things to embrace, truths to remember whenever it seems like God isn't fair. If you're taking notes, you'll see these in your bulletin. The, the first big thought is this. When God doesn't seem fair, remember number one, that God always has a purpose in your pain. God has a purpose. He is good. And, and, and even when you are hurting, God is still working. I don't know how that might look. And maybe right now you're experiencing something, whatever it is. Feeling like, God, where are you? You kind of feel let down. Maybe you lost somebody who was important to you. Had a relationship that's broken. Someone got sick and didn't make it. It could be someone lied to you or, or took advantage of you or gossiped about you. It could be simply just that, that life's not going the way you wanted it to go. It could be the big things, cancer, other things, loss of job. It could be just simply that you're praying for somebody that you love and they're just not getting better. It could be any of many of a number of different things. But whenever you are hurting, whatever level it is, however personal it feels, remember that God has a purpose in it. He's using difficult times to do something in you. In fact, I love the way Peter, who went through some tough times himself, I love the way Peter describes it. First Peter 1, 6-7, as I mentioned earlier. Peter says this about suffering and trials. He says, when we're going through suffering and trials, we have to have the perspective. He says, there's this wonderful joy that's ahead. So when you're suffering, remember, there will be a time where better things will come. I mean, he says, even though you must endure many trials for a little while, so these trials, right, that we're going through, these things that we don't understand, these difficult seasons, they will help us see that our faith is genuine. In those moments, God is 
taking us deeper, helping our roots to grow. Peter says, it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. So your faith is far more precious than any gold might ever be. When your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You see, God has a purpose. God is doing something. God is in the middle of it even when and if you don't see it or understand it. God can be using it to strengthen you. See, when you run towards God, your spiritual roots grow deeper. If you've ever been up on top of the big high mountains, does anything grow there? I've climbed 14,000 feet mountains. I've been on top of Long's Peak in Colorado and a number of other 14,000 plus mountains. Nothing grows there. It's rock. Maybe some snow. Maybe some moss. Pretty much nothing grows there. Where does everything grow? Down in the valleys. Spiritually. Spiritually, we're, we're a lot like that. Some of the best growth you can experience spiritually, unfortunately, comes in the valleys of life. God is in the middle of it. Run towards Him. God doesn't cause the pain necessarily, but God can use the pain every single time. He has a purpose in the pain. Now the second thing that I hope you'll remember is that God is always present in your pain. God has a purpose, and He is always present in your pain when you are hurting. In fact, Psalm 46.1 says that, that God is our refuge and our strength, ever-present help in our times of trouble. Ever-present. He is always with you. So often, we want God just to simply give us what we want. God, give me what I want, right? God, God do this for me. But you see, God wants to show us that He is actually what it is that we need. God, I want you to do this. And instead, God says, I am the source of what you need. There's no better example of this in all of Scripture than the Apostle Paul. If you don't know about the Apostle Paul, Paul is just the most fascinating character in Scripture, I think. I love Paul. And, and, and if you don't know the background of Paul, Paul's that dude. He's standing there. The first Christian who was killed as a martyr was a guy by the name of Stephen. And Paul is there that day. And he's like telling the other guys who were going to kill Stephen, hey, why don't you take off your coat? I'll hold it for you so your arm's nice and loose and free to throw rocks at this guy. Right? That's in the Bible. Paul was there just holding people's jackets so they could stone Stephen. And then he goes on and breathes murderous threats about Christians. He goes before a council and gets permission to go to Damascus to go round up Christians, jail them, and kill them. Paul killed Christians. Okay? That's the background of Paul. And then he meets Jesus and is radically transformed by Christ. And this guy ends up doing more for the gospel than anybody not named Jesus. Probably number three, I suppose, would be Billy Graham. But those are like the big three. Jesus, Paul, Billy Graham, right? Those are the big, big hitters. Paul writes a portion, like a big portion of the New Testament. But yet, if you know the story of Paul, Paul gets this thing he calls a thorn, Right? We don't know what the thorn was, but it's this, this massively painful, destructive thing in his life that, that limits his ability to minister, and it's just a pain. And he, and he pleads repeatedly with God. He has a seasons of seeking healing from God. And you know, if God's going to heal anybody, right? He's going to heal this guy, right? 
I mean, if you know the rest of Paul's story, here's a guy who's been beaten and left for dead multiple times. He's been shipwrecked multiple times. He had a poisonous snake bite him while he's out trying to start churches for Jesus. He's been whipped so many times, his back is scarred beyond measure. Surely God's going to heal Paul, right? Paul says, heal me. Heal me, Lord, heal me. And God says this to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God says, Paul, my grace is, grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Heal me. Change my circumstances. Fix my problems. God says, no, Paul. My grace is enough. No, Paul. I am what you need. Now, if you've ever been through that crucible of life, trial by fire, that refinement that's painful, there's nothing that can prepare you for it, and there's really not words that necessarily can even explain it. But as you work your way through it and come out the other side, you come out with a story where you can say, this is how God helped me through it. I have many stories of my own life where, where I look... And, and in the moment, I didn't understand what God was doing. It didn't make sense. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Lord, why is my mom almost dead? Why, what, when I'm eight years old, why did my mom almost die? Why? Why is this happening to me? Why is my car breaking down? Well, it's an old piece of junk. But why? Right? We have those why questions. Why, 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 why me? Why now? Why here? Why this? God says to us, no, my grace is enough. And in those moments, we can't see it. We don't know how God is working. But 5, 10, 15, 12, 20 years later, we look back and go, oh, now I see how God was working. Now I see what God was doing. Now I see He was there with me. It's kind of like that, that poem, Footprints, right? We, we have one that my mother-in-law hand-stitched, a poem of footprints. And if you don't know that poem, it's that poem where, you know, you're walking on the beach and there's a couple sets of footprints. You're out for a walk with God. And then during part of it, there's only one set of footprints. And you're like, God, where were you during this time, right? And God looks down and says, no. That's when I was carrying you. Your footprints aren't there. But we don't have that perspective in the moment. But God sustains you when you are in pain. He comforts you when you feel like you can't get up for another day. It's in God where we can find the hope to move forward when we didn't know if we could go on. So that one day we will be able to testify that God was in it and He was enough. God's grace is enough. Now Paul, despite this thorn that was never taken from him, actually goes on to say this. That's so what he says in verses 9 and 10. He says, because of this experience of suffering, he says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And then, then he takes it to a whole other level. I mean, it's almost like crazy talk. This is what Paul says. Paul goes on to say, not, not only that... But Paul says, I delight in weakness. I delight in insults. I delight in persecution. I delight in difficulties. For when I am weak, it is actually then that I am strong. When I am weak, His strength is made perfect in me. When I can't get on another day with my life, He is there to carry me. See folks, God is always present in your pain. The bottom line, if you, you look at your life right now, wherever you're at, you might have every right to say, I don't understand why I'm going through this. I don't like it. This moment, this experience, it doesn't seem fair, right? It doesn't seem fair. Why now? Why this? Why me? 
Now you may be going through something that you would never choose to go through, something you never dreamed you would experience. But at the end of it, when you have the perspective, you will see God was there for you if you walk through it in faithfulness. A lot of people will say to us, maybe you have said this, maybe you are saying this now, how can I believe in a God that just doesn't always seem to be caring? But here's a question that I don't think many people consider along with that. Why do so many good things happen to so many bad people? Right? Why, why do so many good things happen to bad people? Now, I don't know about you. I'm not proud to say this. But I'm kind of a bad person. Yes, your pastor just said that. You're like, you're the pastor, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm a pastor, but I'm still a sinner, folks. I don't get it right all the time. I wish I did, but I don't. So why do, why do good things happen to bad people, right? I'm not always a good person. And listen to me, we, all of us, every single one of us are sinners. And if anything good has ever happened to you, well, at some point you need to sit back and say, well, why, why is God doing good things for me? I can kind of be a jerk, right? I'm a sinner. Why is God doing nice things for this bad person? Now, you might not be saying, well, my life is incredibly blessed. But let me remind you, it is. Your life is blessed. First, we're born in America. We won the global lottery. Right? A lot, of, a lot of good things about being born here. Not including mosquitoes and below 20 degree, negative 20 weather. But we're blessed. We traveled here by car today. I think probably almost all of us have flushing toilets, except for maybe the sentients. <laughs> and that's by choice. We had food to eat. My guess is, if you go home, you could change your shoes and change your clothes. Even if you're poor in America, you're still like top 5% of the world rich. Life is actually pretty good. It's a matter of perspective. We get the freedom to worship God. We're not, we're not sitting under a tree right now. We're not having people try to blow up this building while we worship because we worship Jesus. There's people in the world right now seriously worried when somebody's going to come in that door and blow them up. Egypt, places like that. Not even like bad places in the world, so to speak. God really does a lot of good things for a bunch of us really bad people, doesn't He? You might say, well, God, God's not fair. You know what? I'm here to tell you as your pastor, yeah, God isn't fair. Yes, your pastor just told you God is not fair. God is not fair. But He is just. If God was always fair, He would give us what our sins deserve. But because He is just, He sent Jesus, who paid the price. Who, as Scripture says in, in Psalm 103, it says, and I hope you feel this, that, that God does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is great His love for those who fear Him. As far as the east is, is from the West. So far has He removed our sins, our transgressions, our stink from us. If you haven't done it every now and then, you should thank God that He's not fair. That He doesn't give us what our sin deserves. Whenever you're tempted to look at whatever it is you're going through, the crazy stuff in this world, or that personal thing that, that feels unjust. God, why would you allow this to happen? Here's something I would challenge you to do. Don't just think of it from your limited temporary perspective. Think about it from your Heavenly Father's perspective. Your Heavenly Father, who is a Father who loves you, who has a purpose in your pain. 
and who is with you when you are hurting. When you hurt, God hurts with you. There are times when he wants to tell you why you're going through it, but you simply couldn't even understand it. But know that God is working and he is still there. That he has a reason for it. And know that God knows more about hurt than any of us will ever understand. You see, God isn't fair. God sent his son to die for our sin, for our sake when we didn't even deserve it, when we could never earn it. That's not fair, but God did it anyhow. To the point at which where Jesus on the cross goes, my God, my God, why why would you look away from me? Why have you forsaken me? Because God could look at no sin. And unfairly, he sent his son to die on our behalf, to take our place. That is a love beyond anything we could ever imagine or ask for. Our God is not a heartless God. Our God doesn't even just love you, but He is love. It's not what He does, but it is who He is. God is love. So if you've struggled wondering if God cares, He does. More than you will ever know. Folks, God is with you. He is for you. And He absolutely loves you. I'm so glad you came today. And I hope you hear that. He loves you. He is with you. And He's for you. Amen. Let's pray.